I am going to start now. The recording has started. So good morning, everyone. And happy Sabbath. You know, it's a wonderful thing that it's, you know, raining. We really need the rain, you know, so. And it's really wonderful because it really helps us understand uh, what we've been learning about for uh, the past few times. Laura, would you mind if that's what we've got? Um, hopefully there's enough for everyone there. And we'd like to thank our visitor. Sir, what's your name again? William. William. We have a visitor today. And his name is William. Where are you from, William? Comchi? You're from Comchi? Uh, Give him the microphone, please. Can somebody? Can you somebody hand him the microphone, please? The microphone? The microphone. So everyone can hear. Because we have people on the phone as well. And, uh... I was originally born in Louisiana. Uh, my grandparents came from Washington uh, State. My grandfather came from Germany in 1910. My grandma came from Quebec, Canada. Huh. Okay. My grandfather met my grandmother. She already had seven kids. My grandfather worked for her husband in a mill, and uh, my grandpa told him that this, this uh, gauge is bad, and he was the type of guy that he knew everything. And uh, and it blew up on them and, and killed it. Wow, that's too bad. And so about a year later, Grandpa, on Thanksgiving Day, a two days before Thanksgiving, he went to talk to my grandmother and asked her that would he would would she like to go and have dinner with him? And they got married the same day. Wow. So you're from Comchi, though. I'm originally. Uh, you're from Louisiana, from but you're from Comchi. Awesome. In the Valley, and then okay. You make my golf live in your guy. Awesome. Well, it's a pleasure you being here with us. We really appreciate that uh, vi visitors come. I have to live in the Valley for about a year. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, we're really appreciative that visitors come. It's really a, a blessing. That's what we are here for. Yes is that people would be able to come and worship with us. And thank you, Pete, for bringing. This is Peter's uh, cousin. So, um, like I said, this morning's message is part two of the branches of his root. And we're learning about the after the Feast of Pentecost is what we're learning right now. And remember last time we learned, what we were learning about is, is, the, is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, remember? And then the fruits of the Holy, or not the fruits, but the, the, um, the body of Christ who actually received the Holy Spirit. Um, I gave you guys handouts so you can actually follow along with me. Um, so it's a lot easier to, uh, to navigate through this. And did you guys get your handouts? Did you guys get hand Okay, good. So um, the, the scripture reading this morning is Matthew 13, 23. We've learned this before. It says, but he who receives seed on the ground is he who what? Who hears the word and not just hears it, but understands it. So what's the seed? The seed is, yes, the seed is the word of God. Exactly. Now, it's not just enough to hear the word, but we need to understand it. That's what it says here. Who's, who said this? This is Jesus saying this. Jesus is explaining this. But he who received the seed on the ground, and that's agricultural language. Remember, we're learning about the early and the latter rain, right? Jesus is using an agricultural uh, example here for what he's describing, what it means for the seed, what it means to have the seed, what it means to be part of this whole process of a field that the Lord is nurturing, right? And he continues on, who indeed bears fruit and produces, there it is. Some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. So not everybody 
has the same amount of fruit, but everybody will produce fruit. Does that make sense? So this is our uh, scripture reading this morning. Now remember, there was gifts that the Holy Spirit sent onto all the earth. Remember? Now, where can I find that? Do you remember where? You find that in Revelation. Yes, Revelation chapter 5. Remember Revelation chapter 5? It says there in verse 6. Let me just quickly pull that up because it can, I can literally, it literally, my Bible practically pops right there. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ is the lamb. Yes, as though it had been slain, having seven horns. Now, what's seven? What is the description of seven? Completeness. Is that you, Kathy? God bless you. It's a good morning. It's a pleasure to hear from you. Yes, yes. It's so nice to hear from you. So, welcome, sister. So, the lamb. And so it had been slain. So what does that mean? That the lamb was slain. You know, this is presenting to us as we're reading it. And to John, as he's looking at it, that Jesus Christ, as, G as John is looking at this in vision, he had just been crucified. Right? And he prevailed. Remember? So now this is in the throne room. So at Pentecost, remember? Jesus, before Pentecost, spent 40 days with the disciples. People came out of the graves, right? Because the earth shook and the graves are broken open. You can find this in Matthew 27, starting in verse 50 and 51 and 52. So Jesus presents these, these people that came out of the graves, which we believe, many of us believe, are Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, people that came out of the grave that were faithful to the Lord. Were di had died because of persecution, were, were murdered, were martyred for the word of God and came out of the graves. And he demonstrated them as what? As first fruits. And guess what feast that was? During that time, before the feast of Pentecost, there was the feast of first fruits. Before the feast of first fruits, there was the feast of unleavened bread, which means you die to the self and you come out, a newborn baby called born again, right? Jesus demonstrating that comes out of the grave. And that happened on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The next, he has the Feast of First Fruits, the children or the people that came out of the graves. And for 40 days, he spends with the disciples and with all the people to demonstrate that he is the risen Savior, right? Then the Feast of Pentecost, over about 30 miles away from Jerusalem, Jesus is spending time with the disciples and he says, now, you go back to Jerusalem. After all that I've taught you, all the scriptures about how this all happened, why this all happened, and I'm leaving. Where was Jesus going? Heaven. What part of heaven? The Use the microphone. Where's the microphone? The throne room? The throne room. Which throne room? Um, I can't answer that. There's only one. No, no, no. There's three. There's three Oh, oh the, the most holy place. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out, time out. What did you say, uh, Kathy? I, I said you went to the holy place. The holy place. Yes. Now, you know, Thursday, I was, I, I hope I have time. To, I got to yeah. say this. I got to say this. high priest. Yes. Yes, exactly. The high priest. Now, now this might be a little bit of complicated for for visitors, the sanctuary is a place where God told Moses to build way back in Exodus. He said, build me a sanctuary, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, that I may dwell with them. And the sanctuary, just a brief description of it, is the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. And it literally describes the great plan of salvation. When you look at all the items and the furniture that, it, that the Lord had instructed Moses to put in there by his workmanship through people that were skilled in these areas, the, the furniture that's inside the holy place and the most holy place is a literally a description of the cross. Describing the plan of salvation that would soon be coming 
which was the Lord Savior was going to fulfill all these things, which had the seven branch candlestick, the table of showbread had 12 pieces of 12 loaves of bread on a table, had an altar with incense. And then there behind that veil was known as the Holy of Holies, which contained behind that veil. You remember the Ark of the Covenant, which had two cherub angels hammered gold, right? And then there was a rod, Aaron's budding rod, that always is a stick. It's a dead stick. And it keeps budding. Why does it keep budding? It's, it's a representation of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Do you understand? And, and there was a pot of manna. Jesus said, I am the manna that came from heaven. Every single one of these things describes Jesus Christ and fulfillment of Jesus Christ. So that sanctuary that the Lord said to build way back in Exodus is a description of the Savior and what he does. He is the light. He is the bread of life. He is the one that accepts our prayers and takes them and, and uh, receives the incense and, and, uh, and, and is a mediator for our prayers and interprets them to his Father. He is the character of God, which is the law which was uh, the two tablets of stone that sat inside that Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubs. He is the Aaron, Aaron's budding rod. He is the manna from heaven. You see that? And each one of these is in the shape of a cross when you look at the diagram. Now, we are supposed to be the character of Christ. We should be the light of the world. We should understand this word so well with that when we under when we are uh in when we are studying this word that uh oh, okay that when we're studying this word that we are a, a, a lamp unto the feet and a light unto the path directing people to jesus christ the true light that we should understand that's why in matthew 13 it says bless or uh it says uh, but he who received the seed right he who received the seed on the ground is he who hears the word and understands it, partaking in the bread of life. We should be praying for, to the Lord to guide us and direct us in that word. We should be obeying all Ten Commandments and understanding what the pot of man is, what the Aaron's budding rod is. All those things are something that we follow Jesus Christ into the sanctuary. And everywhere he goes, we go. You understand that? Okay, I, mean, I can't get into my story. I'm going to save that because it was an experience that I had on Thursday, which was absolutely shocking to me. And I, I, but I just don't have time. So now, about back to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All right. Remember, they were sent out into all the earth. It says it right here in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 5 and verse 6. Moving on, it says... Uh, uh, and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and on the four living or the end of the four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as though he had been slain. That's Jesus Christ. So John is looking at the lamb as though it had been slain. Was the lamb slain? Yes. But he rose again. Okay. Now this is in heaven. That means when Jesus was there with the disciples, he said, I am leaving. And that was the feast of Pentecost or just before the Feast of Pentecost, 10 days before the Feast of Pentecost, then the clouds of heaven come and pick him up. Those clouds are angels. You read this in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 9, and he ascends into heaven. And where does he go? To, say it loud, holy. to the holy place. He can't go to the most holy place. Why can't he just go to the most holy place? You know, most, yes, because he's our, go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. And, and he is presenting us before his father. He, he's opening the books and, and looking at things. Well, during the time after the Feast of Pentecost, Jesus Christ was, minute, was enacting or displaying his role as high priest keeping the lamp lit, making sure there's enough bread on the table. 
and accepting our prayers and mediation for the Father. Now, at a certain time, Jesus and the throne and the Father and all of that were in the holy place moved into the most holy place. You know that most people say, no, he's just he's in the most holy place. This is what I experienced on Thursday. What's wrong with that picture? What happens, what happens if Jesus went from Pentecost to the most holy place? If, if, he, if he ascended to heaven on Pentecost and went straight over to the most holy place, what happens? This is what I was trying to explain to this person. Then what you're doing is you're destroying Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. There is no such thing as seven churches then. Because there's at a certain point, and this is really complicated we'll be getting into this later as we get into the what's called the during the feast the long hot summer because during the long hot summer of the feast year while the there was spring feasts and then there's the summertime and then there's the fall feasts right and this is all about agricultural in the palestine region do you understand that and jesus fulfilled all the spring feasts so there's the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. Jesus was all of them, right? So then just, after, just as the summertime was starting, historically, for the Christian church, Jesus goes to the most holy place. And what is the summer about? Remember, it's about drought. There's no rain. There's no feast. Bread's getting scarce. Wheat's getting scarce. Rations are getting low. Now, if you look at that spiritually, during the time of the first century, all the way to 1798, there was a summertime that was going on because there was a lack of bread. What is bread? Remember? It's the word of God. The light almost went out because there was persecution of those who carried the word of God. They'd be burnt at the stake if they even carried one leaf from the word. They were tortured, even if they were talking about it. So the light almost went out, but the high priest in heaven was keeping that lamp lit. Giving that bread to certain people, such as the Waldenses, the Abigenses, the Huguenots, the Cathars, right? And they hid in the wilderness during this long, hot summer. And then when the fall feasts begin, it begins with the Feast of Trumpets, <laughs> right? Feast of Trumpets begins announcing that the harvest is going to begin. And then rain comes. The early rain starts, right? Remember? The early rain starts, refreshes the seed. That's why the seed is here. That's why we've been discussing the early rain and the latter rain. Because this all has a process for us to, to absorb in our heart that we need to be following the same premise of where Jesus is. So if you destroy any process about him being in the holy place, what happens to the Feast of Trumpets? We have to find a landmark when that actually started. It destroys everything. And the person's like, well, maybe us Adventists are wrong. We're wrong. It's like, no, we're not. It's not about us being wrong. It's about you saying the Bible is wrong. Well, we don't need to be worried about Adventism, Dave. We just need to be following Jesus Christ. And I had to say, Jesus Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist in principle and in, and in character. And he... Right. Yeah, you have to follow the sanctuary. If you take away, but see, the, 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 the veil was ripped in two. So that eliminated the holy place. You know where this comes from? Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford. And when he started explaining this, I knew right there. Yeah. Now, this is the thing, people. We need to know this. So when we're encountering these kind of things, we know what the word of God says, because if we don't, we'll, we'll eventually start compromising and going, well, maybe so, because I don't know, because I just, I, 
I haven't studied it out, so maybe this person's right. Do you understand how important it is to understand the word of God? Like Jesus said here, those who hear and understand, you have to know why you're here today and not tomorrow. You have to understand why you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Jesus Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist. He worshiped on the seventh day, and he believed that he was coming again. That's Seventh-day Adventist. An Adventist is one that believes that Jesus is coming again. Therefore, was Jesus not a Seventh-day Adventist? Moving on. So remember that the slain lamb had been slain, and he had seven horns and seven eyes. Remember what seven is? How many, how many days did it take to, to create the world? Six days. And on the seventh day, it was all good. Real good. Very good. Right? Seven is the number of perfection in God's eyes. Eyes is that he sees all things. He knows all things. So the seven horns, the seven eyes, it says, having seven horns and seven eyes, what are those? Which are the seven spirits of God that were sent out onto all the earth. This is a landmark right here in Revelation 5, 6. This is just as they're praying in the upper room. As they're praying in the upper room, the slain lamb who has presented himself to the father is being coronated as the high priest. And he pours out gifts to those in that upper room called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has these seven characteristics. And it was sent out unto all the earth. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, is a landmark that points us to right at the Feast of Pentecost this happened. And all this is taking place in heaven that John has seen in the holy place. If you take away the holy place, you're literally wiping out over 1,200 years of history, 1,800 years of history. And then what does that mean? Well, then there's no reason for 1844, because that's when the Feast of Trumpets started, at the time of the Sixth Church period in Philadelphia, in the Sixth Church. Now, this might be complicated to those who don't understand the Word of God. I urge you to go investigate then. What is this all about? Go read it. Go study it. Go find out. I didn't know. I flunked kindergarten twice. And if I can figure it out, a plowboy can figure it out. A person who can't read can figure it out. You have to ask the Lord to pour the Holy Spirit on you. And what is those seven spirits? The seven characteristics of God, remember, or, or the, of uh, the, the Holy Spirit? Isaiah chapter 11. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of knowledge and wisdom and counsel and might. The fear of the Lord, right? And I forgot one. I always forget one. There's seven of them, all right? Remember, there was gifts the Holy Spirit sent unto all the earth. And let's see the verses in scriptures and put them in together like a puzzle because they're kind of scattered through the, old, through the New Testament in three, three or four, five different places where you can literally piece them together and say, oh, this is the gifts and this is the body. And you can start piecing it together, okay? First Corinthians chapter 12, verse four, there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit. See what I'm saying? The same spirit. And what's that spirit? That's the Holy Spirit. There are diff yes, verse five of 1 Corinthians 12, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. Now, why is Paul unpacking this? Because he's describing to those who are reading that you're part of this. You are part of this. 
When you took up the cross and said, I am a character of Christ, I want to be with Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. You're picking this up. Do you understand that? You don't just come to church and say, well, I'm going to go back to my leisurely and drink some lemonade on a patio and just enjoy the week. There's things that the Lord wants us to do. And how I can prove this is just imagine if the disciples for three and a half years are being schooled by Jesus, by the greatest teacher there ever was, the most incredible prophet there ever was. And he said, oh, I got to go. See you guys later. And they, Peter looks at John and John looks at Matthew. And whew, that was interesting. Well, I got to go shopping. Yep, I got to go take off. I'm going to go back to my old school life the way that I was. And that was interesting. And then just what would happen to the Christian church if they just went back to it would have fizzled and disappeared. Exactly. You understand? We're no different. In order for us to be a remnant, we have to be the same as the original. You understand? So there are diversities of activities, but it is in the same God who works all in all. So what would be the difference of ministries, the differences of ministries? What is that? What is that phrase? There are differences in verse five of ministries, but the same Lord. What is that? What's the difference of a ministry? You know what that is? It's the body of Christ. The body of Christ. The church. The church. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for what? The profit of all, that all would benefit from a gift that you have, Peter. You have, your cousin has a gift. He just has to walk in church and say, Lord, give me that or reveal to me that gift. And then he could, he could change the whole, he could, if it's possible, if he allows it, he could change this whole Ukiah area. Do you, do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that because if it's in the will and the glory of the Lord, he will do it. Even to a plowboy, an illiterate. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is, the, is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now, these are the gifts. One to the word of knowledge through the spe same Spirit, verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. And to another, different kinds of tongues. And another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, these are all in order. They're in chronological order in the way that he's describing them. And what's last? Interpretation of tongues. What's second to the last that's most important? Tongues. Okay. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as I want it to happen. I'm going to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm holy. When I walk into that laundry room, I'm holy. And I'll tell the devil, you get out of here, devil. You just get out of here. And I just kick the devil out. And I just throw people away. I just push them right by the forehead and they fall down and everyone just hoops and hollers. Is that right? Is that what it says? It says, as he wills, the spirit wills. You can't do anything to the devil. Do you know that? You know, the devil is the most strongest, powerful angel that was ever created. And he still is. And we think, go ahead, Pete. It says what? What does it say there in James? Pray to the Lord, right? First, go to the Lord, and he will chase them away, right? It's Jesus is the only one that can chase the devil away. To think that we can use the Holy Spirit is a grave mistake. And the devil hears that, and he goes, oh, oh this is great. Okay, let's, let's play along with this one. And he'll make it look like it. So everyone's like, see? I got the Holy Spirit, man. I got him yanking on the chain like a dog. And this, you see this all the time. It's a false spirit. 
You don't treat the oh, it, it, it. I get goosebumps when I see that because you don't treat the Holy Spirit like that. Oh, man, you're walking on dangerous ground. He's divine. He's God. That's God. You don't mess with God. And thank God he's got so much mercy that he uses that to teach people a serious lesson that blows up in their face and you pray that it does. Not that they get hurt or that they're damaged, but they come to the truth with wisdom and knowledge and understanding through counsel through the might of the Holy Spirit. Not by some Kenneth Copeland or Rick Warren or Joel Olstein. They got no power whatsoever. None. So the body of Christ would contain what? The body of Christ would contain wisdom, knowledge, faith. Everyone has a measure of faith. You know that? You know that faith is not yours. Romans chapter 10 tells us that it's a gift from God. You understand that? Even faith is a gift. It says it right here. It is not your faith. You obtain faith because the Lord is, is merciful enough to give it to you. And you, he works with you with that measure of faith. And he wants it to grow even bigger than a mustard seed. You, know, you ever seen a mustard plant? How big they get? Birds literally build houses in these big things. And it comes from a little tiny seed. That's why, that's why Jesus used that as a description, as a parable. Even to the mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Do you understand? But it's not your faith. It's the Lord's faith who can do that, not yours. We have to put these in the biblical perspective, using the Bible as a principle, not my own understanding. What does it say there in uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 28? Do not use your own understanding. You lean on the Lord and his understanding, all right? Healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation of tongues. That's one list. Why was there gifts? Why did God give people gifts? To spread the word. To spread the word. If, let's see what the Bible says, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. What if you're wrong, Peter? What do you do? No, no condemnation. Let's just, you know, because Jesus is not here to condemn. You understand that, right? He's not in the business of condemnation. He's in the business of education, educating, bringing people to the truth. You understand? So let's say you're wrong. Let's just say you're wrong. What do you do? You try to find out where you went wrong and you go, okay, Lord, I need to change, right? That's what you do. Ephesians 4, verses 12 to 14. Uh, verse 12 says, for the, what is the gifts for? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So here's, here's a separation for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. That's what, so you're right. In general, it would be going out. There's one of them. So you're right, Peter. So one, equipping the saints. Two, for the working of ministry, and three, for the edification of the body. What does edification mean? The betterment. The betterment, okay. Uh, yeah, improvement, teaching, to build up. That's what it is, the body of Christ. For how long? Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Does that mean I've arrived? I've arrived. <laughs> I've arrived. I'm so good. Is that what it's saying? You know, most a lot of people feel that way, though. They're like, you know, we've arrived, man. All we're doing now is just waiting for the Lord to come. You know, let's, you know, let's bring this this uh, country up, and this country's gonna fight it. We're gonna fight and kill anybody who doesn't agree with us. It's like, oh no. Till we all come to the unity of faith. Oh boy, that's a dangerous one. People twist that around all the time. It's called ecumenicalism. Eh, doctrine doesn't matter. Let's just all get along. The Lord will deal with the doctrines when we get upstairs. Is that true? You know, that's a, that's a big banner. What's wrong with that? Who cares about the doctrine? Oh, they're so tedious. 
Ah, oh, I don't understand. I can't understand this word. Why don't we just like get along? Love, love, love. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Jesus said in the end of time, in our time that we're in, take heed that nobody deceives you. Because why? Because many will come in my name. Many will say I am the Christ. Now that's not just some Buddhist guy saying I'm, I'm Jesus Christ. There's people that are taking his name and principle and character and saying that's Jesus Christ. What we're doing is Jesus Christ. And you have to examine it and go, am I being deceived? How do you know if you're being deceived? Huh? You study. Okay, you study. You have to have something outside of yourself that shows you that you're being deceived. So in other words, how do I know if I'm sleeping? And while I'm sleeping, I'm like sitting there in my sleep going, I'm sleeping right now. No. How do I know? Because when I wake up, something has to wake me up alarm clock or when i wake up eight hours later i go wow i was sleeping you understand what i'm saying something has to show you and your word the word of god is the principle that puts in the character the truth of matters everything should be examined by this not by me not by richard not by pastor bachelor or it should be examined by the word individually do you understand because you can be deceived and not even know it okay where was i that's what deception is now there's four kinds of deception there's self-deception mass deception intentional deception Ugh, i can't remember the last one Ugh, I can't but those things well, you know what the most important the most most grievous of all of them is self-deception you understand? You can see a lot of people being deceived and you can get out of that. But if you're self-deceived, if you really believe something and I come to you and I show you the, the absolute opposite and contrary and you go through cognitive dissonance and you keep walking in that direction, that's self-deception. It's one of the most difficult. You understand? You, you have to examine your own heart and say, Lord, am I in the will of you? And you do that by reading and studying and understanding the word and applying your principles in, in your daily life to what the word of God says. This is what Paul is showing. In order for us to properly use the gifts that God gave us, we have to do it in his will. And when we do these things in his will, oh, the, even though we might be persecuted, we know where we're going. And I can say, I will be at the coming of the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God. Because that's what that means. Is when Jesus shows up. When Jesus comes. This means before Jesus comes. And this is what it says there. Until we all come to the unity of faith and knowledge. Verse 13. Of the Son of God. You know when that's going to happen? You know when I, Well, at first point. It's when the latter rain happens and people start coming out of Babylon just before the close of probation and start understanding that they were duped. The major fulfillment of that is when we're sitting there for a thousand years going, what in the world was this all about? Until we come to the full knowledge of the son of God and see what this was really all about. God gives us a measure of understanding that we need to make it home. He holds back a lot of things for a very good reason, because people would panic. They would freak out if they could see the darkness of the angels that are working to make us dead, separated from the Lord. Do you understand? It says there, till we all come into unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That perfect man is when we're, our corruptible is gone and our incorruption is, our, I mean, our, our corruptible is gone and uh, uh, and the uh, perfected of our nature is transformed, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right? To the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ. You see that? Now that can happen right now. You don't have to wait till then. Did you know that? That can happen right now. 
You don't have to wait for anything to happen. You can say, Lord, I want this right now. And the Lord can start working on that process for you right now. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. It is it, until, the, the, until it is death and this fullness of Christ to a perfect man, to the faith and knowledge. All this is until it is needed no more. That would be when the time of the close of probation. Because when the doors close, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, someone tried to tell me that uh, uh, the, these certain prophecies in Daniel 11 are, uh, you know, uh, are for uh, the, the end time. And I had to explain to him. So that, that means at the very end, after all these things have happened, there, there's certain, or Daniel 12, I'm sorry, it was Daniel 12. And I'm like, what? So it's all linear fashion, huh? It, it's, not, uh, it's not done in Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew poetry that they use as, as a chiasm. Huh? That's strange. So you're telling me then, uh, well, what's prophecy for them? Well, if, if the doors close and there's, there's the righteous stay righteous, the wicked stay wicked, which it says there in Daniel 12, well, what's prophecy for them? Because it's prophesying then in your mind to the end and beyond the close of probation. There wouldn't be no need for it. People have made their decision. The door is closed. That's it. Even if they're still living, that's it. Were they still living when uh, Noah was building the ark? Were they still alive when the doors closed of that ark? People were outside the ark. Did the rain come? No. It took seven days. Seven days. Were there still people? Did the doors of probation close for them? Do you understand what I'm saying? What did Jesus say? As in the days of Noah? So it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. You understand? That's important. So that doesn't make any sense. And I, What's the reason for prophecy? There would be no reason for prophecy after the close of probation. It's all been prophesied. You understand what I'm saying? you got to work these things out. Take these things to court. Take these things to your own court in your home. Hammer them out. Exhibit A, Exhibit B. And, and the, the judge, right? And you let the defendant or the prosecutor say what he's got to say. And you hammer that out from what the judge says and the jury. And you become the jury and say, it is written. Either it's true or it's false. You understand what I'm saying? You have to take these things to court. These are very important topics. They're going to become even more profound as time goes on. You know, Jesus said, you're going to have to be standing up in front of kings and queens explaining why you're an Adventist. Why do you worship on the seventh day and everybody else? We're mandating a, se a first day of the week. What are you doing, man? Why are you going against us? Come on. And it, well, I don't know. Because somebody told me? Huh? Because Saturdays, and then you have to prove that. And this is going to be taken away. It's not even going to exist. You're not even going to have a Bible. Jesus says what in uh, uh, John chapter 14, I think, verse 17, that those things that I've given you at this time will be at times for you when you need to remember. Oh, no, you're not. Because if, if, you have, if you let the Holy Spirit work with you, Pete, you won't have to worry about anything that you don't have here. Because he'll give it to you to remember, even though you wouldn't have remembered. And then you know what happens? It happens to me all the time. It gets taken away. I'm like, ah, what was that? It didn't matter because I used it. The Lord used me at that moment for somebody. And then later I'm like, ah, what was that? And I read, oh, yeah, that's right. He took it away. He only needed it for that moment. Okay. It's like, then I got to go find it again so I can elevate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's right. But at the time, I couldn't remember, but the Holy Spirit. For that person at that time. And I remember what he what Jesus said in John. Go ahead, Mary. Use the microphone. Yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Yes. When you already put it in your mind, right? That's why you're here. So it gets put in your mind. But to help you, it's to understand and to understand it. To walk with it. The more you walk with it. And Jesus will use that. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Why are the gifts important? Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians there, chapter 12, that we should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. There you go. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You understand? Plotting, yeah. What does it mean to edify? Remember what it means? To instruct, to improve morally and spiritually, to build up. Gifts are given to every person on this planet. Did you know that? Let me give you a point in, in this, okay? Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And he's talking to Jeremiah. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, when Jeremiah came out of the womb, was he already like, I'm a Christian? Didn't he have to learn that? Didn't he have to grow that? God gave him a gift. And as, as the Holy Spirit's working on him, and he grows and he grows and he learns and he learns, and the Lord says, I need to use you. I gave you a gift a long time ago. I need to use you. Now, majority of people, the devil goes, I want to use that. And he uses it. You see what I'm saying? We have to do it as he wills. You understand? So if the Lord chooses for some and others, for some to be and others not to be, that would be called predestinationalism. Eeny, meeny, mighty you. Eeny, meeny, mighty you. You're good. You're not. You stay. You go. You have gifts. You don't. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Lord pours out gifts on everybody. But people say, I choose to let the Lord. Here's another example. The fact is that we are all appointed, but few have chosen. And Jesus said that. The Lord lets man choose from whom he will serve. Saul of Tarsus was a man of great knowledge. He had a gift. Saul of Tarsus. You know who Saul of Tarsus is? He became Paul. Not Saul, King Saul. Not King Saul in, the, in First Samuel, talking about Paul. His name was Saul, and he lived in Tarsus, okay? Okay? He was a great man of knowledge. He was trained by Gamaliel. 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 The, one of the most greatest uh, Pharisaic uh, teachers that could have ever been born. I mean, he was a very smart man. He had a gift. And guess what? What was Saul doing with that? What was he doing? He was persecuting, dragging people to Jerusalem. But this was the working of the enemy until he was visited by the Lord. And when, when was, was then, then he was given a gift. Was that when he got a gift, when he was visited by the Lord? No, the Lord recruited Saul and turned him into Paul. And Paul was born again. You understand? And that, and that gift was utilized for what was meant to be used for. What did the Lord instruct Paul to do when he was converted? What did he do? You find this in Acts chapter 9, the whole story about it. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what we all should be asking. Then the Lord said to him, arise and what? Go to the city and you'll be told what you must do. Right? Did he say, go start a new church? You're on your own, buddy. And I'll just guide you through it. You just walk through the desert for a while and we'll just figure it out together. You know, you just be my body. You'll be everything. Is that what he said? No. He said, go to the city and you will be told what to do. So when he, in the verse 19 says, and when he had received food, he was strengthened by who? He was told to go to the church. And so then they were scared. They're like, dude, we don't want this guy here, man. He's been murdering us, man. What are you doing bringing this guy in? And uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Court, not Cornelius. Uh, oh, Dave. See, I, I forget sometimes. The, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyways, the man that the Lord woke up 
in a dream and said, you need to go take care of this man, Saul. I have plans for him. And they're like, no way, man, this guy's crazy. And he's like, no, he's going to go and you're going to take care of him. And then it says there in verse 19, then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. So what did he do? Paul did not start a church or begin another church. He did not look for his gift. He obeyed the Lord and went to the church and began using the gift that God given him for the glory of Jesus Christ. So he takes the enemy and instead of killing one of the enemy soldiers, what does he do? He causes Saul to defect from the enemy side to work for him. Isn't that better? Doesn't that make more sense? So who's utilizing the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Who's utilizing them? Who? The body. Romans 12, verse 4 says, For as many, for for as we may have many members, but in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in portions to our faith or a ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches and teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives liber with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So who's using the gifts? Those who are doing according to the Lord when he instructs us to be a member of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, Paul says, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of your calling, which you were called. Not the one that you weren't called with. If you're not a preacher, don't be a preacher. A lot of people want to be preachers. They want to get up and speak. And so the Lord might not have called you to be a speaker. A lot of people, you know, they want to heal. But, you know, Lord might not have called you to be a healer, but we should be working in the process of healing ourselves through the working of the healing ministry of Jesus Christ, how he taught everyone what they should be doing for their own bodies so that we could demonstrate to others what they could do with their bodies in a better way, in, in, in the way that God intended. You understand what I'm saying? Verse two, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering and bearing with one another in love. We have to do it in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of your of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith. And guess what? One baptism. When you're baptized, you're taking up the armor of God. And that means you're a disciple and you're supposed to be walking in the character of Christ as a member of the body of Christ. One God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says he was ascended on high. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Do you know what that means to give captivity captive? He took sin and put it on a, on a chain and bound it and said, it doesn't need to be no more. It is done. Is that correct? Do you understand what I'm saying? So he took captivity captive. Isn't that right? Isn't that awesome? And, get, and then he gives gifts to men. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and some teachers for what? For the equipping of the saints, for the working of ministry, and what else? For the edifying of the body of Christ. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing individually as he wills. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. That means there's an order of things. After that, miracles and gifts of healing, health, administration, variety of tongues. So the body of Christ is apostles, 
then prophets, then evangelists, then pastors, and then teachers, and then ministers, and then people with miracles, and doing healing, and helps, administration, and tongues. And you know what's crazy is, is this is how it goes when they started going out to teach the gospel to the people. The apostles would go out, and then after them, the prophets would go out. And then after them, the evangelists would come in and start building up. And then once they have a church established, then the pastor would come in and the teachers would be there and the ministers would be there. And they'd be building up churches like in Ephesus and in Thyatira and in Smyrna and in Heropolis and in Laodicea and all these places. They work this way in order. An apostle would come like Paul and he'd start teaching and showing and people would be blown away. And pretty soon he'd be gathering together people in that area. And then they, they'd be starting to distribute their gifts as a prophet, a evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. All of them would start coming in, in order, and then that church would be fortified. Isn't that beautiful? In order. In order. This is very important because people are taking tongues and putting that first. You have to, you have to use tongues in order to be part of the body of Christ before anything else. And it's like, but tongues is very last. Remember, we, we learned about this. Why don't we use the gift of tongues right now? We don't need them. We have interpreters. If we need them, if they're there, then God bless them. If there's a reason for to be using God, God will use them. But 99.9% .9 of the time, we have interpreters. If I go to the Philippines, I, I ask an interpreter. And I speak in English, and the interpreter interprets. Why else would there need to be an interpreter? Because nobody's going to understand what I'm saying. Exactly right, right? So that was the full list of what? The body of Christ. To be servants who utilize the gifts. And they utilize wisdom and knowledge and faith and healing and miracles and prophecy and discernment and helps and ministrations. And notice what is last, like I said, tongues and interpretation of tongues. So... This is where we left off. The understanding of the body of Christ, we have unpacked the gifts that the body is used for what? Remember what the body of Christ uses those gifts for what? To equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. And prophets, we left off with prophets last time. Prophets were expounders and explainers of the word of God, and they still are. That, will, that had been made known to them by supernatural means, they are mentioned along with apostles. The idea of foretelling is not essential to the meaning of the word, nor is it pre predictive. Is it the predictive element found in all prophetic utterances? You know, a prophet is just speaking for God. That's what it is. And it could be just speaking for God out of the word. It doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, every time I see a uh, if I, if Ellen White, if I was around during Ellen White time, is she going to speak a, a prophetic word today? You know, oh, she, she did this with the salt. What does that mean? Is she going to prophesy? It's like, no, it's not what it means. You know, prophesying means that you're speaking for the Lord. And sometimes he does that through visions. Sometimes he does that through uh, dreams. Sometimes he does it just through the word of mouth, through, from the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? The prophetic gift was indispensable to the founding of the church in the New Testament times and is the appointed guide of the remnant church today. Do you know that every time something major was going to happen, God would send a prophet first to announce it? In all shapes and sizes, you read in the Bible, he would send a prophet before a major uh, event would take place. Do you understand? In Revelation 19.10, it says, uh, Revelation 19.10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. This is John. He's looking at an angel who has just revealed to him some astounding things. And he said, and the angel said, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who has or have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of a prophecy. So what is the spirit of prophecy? What is that? It's the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember what the spirit is? Spirit gives gifts. One of the gifts is prophecy. Guess what? Prophecy 
is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Testifying for Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, the revealing of it. Reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and this is the reason for prophecy. What is prophecy for? To speak edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. That's what it should be there for. It's in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. And it says, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's what prophecy is there for. Isn't it wonderful to know when, when all things are falling apart around us and breaking apart at the seams? I can look at the word of God and go, I know the end of the book. I study the prophecies. I know who's going to win. Done. Okay. Proceed, world. Right? Because I know who's going to win. Now I just need to be on the right side. When, it, all, when all these things are done, I want to be on the right side. And when I read the word of God, and I study it, and I understand it, it's comforting. Isn't it? And then I got an exhortation. I got to help people be grafted and edified. Help them understand it even more, too. That's part of the process of being the body of Christ. It's not for me. It's for other people. And the Lord, through other people, as they learn, are growing me. Because I'm being rubbed against people and their different views and different thoughts. And I have to sit there and think about these things and unfold them through the word of God. Hammer them out. Take them to court. You see what I'm saying? We're a bunch of rocks inside a big uh, turning, uh, one of those polishers, and just being rubbed together, <laughs> just bashing together. And what is it doing? It's rubbing out the edges, all the roughness, so that when it comes out, we're smooth, polished rocks that God has created. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so this whole thing about the body of Christ, we clash sometimes. And the devil uses that. But we have to do it with love. You understand? So, prophecy is to promote spiritual growth, to urge the pursuit of godliness. That's exhortation and encouragement. To aid and help people in spiritual growth. That's what prophecy is for. Proverbs 29 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Oh, isn't that interesting? So a prophet would have to be keeping the law. And when there is no prophet, the people perish. That is horrifying. That's why it's really scary when people are saying, yeah, Ellen White, mm, even though she was, she was given the gift of prophecy, it is hands down. There is no doubt about it. I've hammered it out, beat it, <laughs> just turned it upside down, tried to melt it. It didn't work. She's a, she was a prophet. And when you take that away and people start walking away from the prophet, when there is no vision, the people perish. What is this? Hmm? Yes, vision being, yes. Uh, Chronicles, Second Chronicles. I believe 21, maybe. It says, believe in the prophets and you will prosper. I think it is. I could be wrong. I'm just going off the top of my head, my memory. It's either first or second chronicles, but it says, believe in his prophets and you will prosper. It's something to remember. Yes, and you will be established. Ellen White put it this way, my life today, page 163. I don't know if I, I didn't put this in the handout. Maybe I did. I don't know. To those who love God, it will be the highest delight to keep his commandments and to do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Isn't that true? Doesn't that make sense? Just obey the Lord. You know what the whole problem is? is? People don't want to obey the Lord. That's what it is. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Debbie. 2020. Second Chronicles 2020. Thank you. I knew I was close. But, ah, see, you got to remember these things. God, put it in your heart. Remember these things. Anyways, thank you, Deborah. So my life today, page 163, to those who love God, it would be the highest delight to keep his commandments. Isn't that true? 
and to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Says the psalmist, the law of the Lord is perfect. How wonderful it is, simplicity. In its simplicity, its comprehensiveness and perfection is the law of Jehovah. It is so brief that we can easily commit every precept to memory. Did you know that? I just demonstrated that. I forgot about it. I didn't read this all. I didn't. I read this last night. And I was like, I need to put this in. Amen. And I put it in and I just read it because I'm, you know, I was kind of in a hurry. But I so I didn't know this was in here. So here the Lord is trying to trying to help us along here. Say this is true, right? So is the law. Uh, OK, so it is so brief that we can easily commit every precept to memory. All the Ten Commandments. And yet so far reaching as to express the whole will of God and to take cognizance, cognizance, not only of the outward actions, but of the thoughts and intents, the desires and emotions of the human heart. So it could be so vast. That's, there could be so many things that I have to look at and go, Lord, I can't do this. And he goes, exactly, exactly. Let me do it. That's what he wants. Human laws cannot do this. You know, they, they can look at the outward, but they can't look in the inward. They can deal with the outward. There it is. There you can deal with the outward actions only. The law of God takes note of the jealousy, envy, hatred, malignity, re revenge, lust, and ambition that surge throughout the soul, but have not found expression in the outward action. So even though we could be hiding those things, the law out there can't say, I know what's in your heart, but the Lord can. And that's most important. And these sinful emotions will be brought into account in the day when God shall bring every work into judgment. It's really important how we walk our walk every day. Did you know that? With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, there is no mystery in the law of God. And all can comprehend the great truths which it embodies. He can. The feeblest intellect can grasp these rules. Obedience to the law is essential. Not only to our salvation, but to our own happiness and the happiness of all whom are we are connected. Isn't that true? You know, there was a fire that happened in my neighborhood like four times now. Almost burnt down the whole neighborhood. It's so horrifying. Remember? It, Laura lives in the neighborhood, you know, and I told one of my, not my Buddhist, but she's more of a magical spiritist friend that I know. And I said, you know, it's really good. It says in the Bible that it's good that there's a godly man in the area because the Lord will bless the area. And she looked at me like, what? What do you mean? I said, it's really good, not because of me, but because the Lord recognizes there was a godly man and he'll protect the whole area so that I can come tell you about the Lord. Do you understand? If, if I'm showing the character of God, don't people kind of perk up and go, what's up with him? And it's not for me. Ah, now I got a moment to witness the testimony of Jesus Christ. See how that works? All for his glory. It is good. Just imagine if there was no godly people in this world. What would happen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm, it would be disastrous, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All would see right in their own eyes. Remember we read that before, Laura? Judges. Read the last words of Judges. The very last words. Judges 25, I think it is. Horrifying. There is no mystery in the law of God. All can comprehend the great truth, which, is it, which it embodies. The feeblest intellect can grasp these rules. Obedience to the law is essential, not only to our salvation, but to our own happiness and the happiness of all whom we are connected. Man's happiness must always be guarded by the law of God. The law is the hedge which God has placed about his vineyard. What's the vineyard? Remember what we're learning right now? The branches of his root. And he is the vineyard, or he's the vine, and we are the branches. And the Lord, the Father, is the vine dresser. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 15? 
that's what consists of his vineyard is his branches, which is us. By it, those who obey are protected from evil. See what I mean? And the people around us are protected from evil. There's evil that happens around us, and we don't even know that happened because the angels are beating it down. Stifling it before it even comes to fruition. Can you, can, if we've seen, peel back just a little bit of the veil and see what's really going on over our heads, we would freak out. You understand what I'm saying? By it, those who obey are protected from evil. We owe to him all that makes life desirable. And he asks of us the affections of the heart and the obedience of that is the most important. Let me read that again. He asks of us the affections of the heart and the obedience of the life. That's the most important. The obedience of the life. Of life. You know what that means? You know, the most important thing I need to understand how to be a friend of God. That's it. Right. His precepts, if obeyed, will bring happiness into the home life, happiness to every individual. And then she wrote. And what does obedience result? And I put that in. What does obedience result? And she put in. Right doing will bring peace and holy joy. Oh, peace and joy. What are those? What are those? Fruits of the spirit. Fruits of the spirit. Ah, but the gift of prophecy, we are blessed by his word. And those who are obeying his word and believe in the true prophets are blessed by God and are his protected children. Do you see how important this is for profit? So what is the gift of prophecy? It is speaking and teaching the word of God. Now concerning tongues and the gift of prophecy, uh, inside here, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 to 33, it says, it says this. This kind of has a twofold thing. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm? Or how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalms, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification, to build up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, now this is important. Let there be two or at, or at the most three in each turn and let one interpret. It doesn't mean the whole church, and I've seen it, that so we don't know how to speak in the Spirit, so Lord, please bless us in the Spirit. Let us pour out the Spirit on us, Lord. Humana, humana. And everyone starts going off, and it's just a big babbling soup of what is this? Blah, 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 blah. I've seen some weird things in Africa where it's like, man, they're doing voodoo, and they call that Jesus. Like, what in the world is that? I've seen people just flopping and flipping and screaming and yelling and, and they, oh, that's tongues. Like, that's not what it says in the Bible. It says, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn. That means one at a, one at a time. And then let one interpret. Because how are you going to understand if they're speaking in a language you don't understand? Verse 28 says, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Going direct, Christians going directly against what Paul instructed by the Holy Spirit. And let him speak to himself to God. So if you want to go do that in your closet, that's up to you, man. But don't bring it in the church and start speaking this babbling stuff. What is that all about? Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anyone is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent, for you can all prophesy one by one. That means you can all speak the word. Sometimes the Holy Spirit starts blessing each one of us, and we're learning something, and one by one, someone will bring up something. You understand? Let's prophesy. That all may learn and may be encouraged. There you go. Prophesying is there to be learned and encouraged. You understand that? So, you know, we've had Sabbath school lessons before where we're all interacting. 
and people, you know, start speaking up because they learned something and then we all get encouraged. Right. But no, we're not sitting there going, oh, I have a pro uh, Everyone's got a prophesy now. Everybody, you know, I saw this in the Mormon church one time. I was like, whoa, what in the world? And people were like, they, they felt like they're compelled. They had to. They had to. And I didn't know what they were talking about. McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken are going to be the thing in uh, the coming 10 years. And we all need to put our stocks and bonds. What? What are we? What? What are we doing? What is this? What is this? And everyone, clap, clap. Amen. Like, this is not biblical. And it's not for condemnation, but for education, for edification, for building up. Well, you have to go time out, time out. But at the time, I didn't know any better. I just kind of went along. <laughs> okay, I guess. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means that a prophet better be speaking in the same language as Isaiah spoke. Because it's all the same spirit. It comes from, so if that person is not obeying the Ten Commandments, that is the very first test that I put. That person claims to be a prophet. Do you, do you obey the fourth commandment? Ah, it's been done away with. Bleh, wrong. <laughs> okay, I don't care what you say. You can't be walking in the same spirit as Isaiah, because Isaiah did. He worshiped on the Sabbath day. Jesus did, Paul did, Peter did. It was like, if you're not walking in this, in the same spirit, wrong, <laughs> sorry, next, okay? For verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion. There it is, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. See what I'm saying? There has to be an examination because it is so easy to be deceived. So easy to be deceived. And the devil has been studying each one of us for how old we are. He's got angels. He, he's not here. The devil doesn't care about us. He's got angels assigned to us. He's busy doing real things. But he's got angels assigned to us. And they've been studying us all our lives. And they know exactly how to tantalize your lusts. My lusts. And they work on it. That's why this has to be the principal guide in compass. You understand? Evangelists. That is a preacher of the gospel. Evangelists were apparently not attached to any particular locality, but bore their testimony from place to place. They probably did not exercise the full authority of apostles. See what I'm saying? The first apostles, then prophets then there was teachers and all the and then the evangelists would come and just gather the people together in that city in that place to build up a church to edify and build up the gospel the, the body of christ second timothy verses four or chapter four verse five says but you be watchful in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist Fulfill your ministry. He was talking to young Pete, or I mean, a young, young Timothy. All right. The ministry of evangelists appears to have been directly directed chiefly to the heathen, whereas the pastor and a teacher served a local congregation. See, so they bring in an evangelist to bring people in, and then they bring in teachers and they bring in pastors to manage that locality. Right. The question may be raised as to why Paul does not refer to bishops and deacons and others at this point. Apparently, he is here speaking of those who were con conspicuous, that is clearly visible by having received the gift of the Spirit for the purpose of instruct instruction rather than those whose work was more administrative without, however, implying either superiority or infor inferiority. These offices were not mutually exclusive. So they all had a basis and a premise and were needed, but they weren't, he could tell who was going to do it for their own benefits. And they're like, you can't be an evangelist. This, he'd be explaining the, the differences and the, the, uh, the, the uh, instructions or the ingredients needs to be of this. So pastors and teachers, <laughs> the structure of this phase in Greek suggests that Paul intends to speak of two phases and one office and effective any effective ministry is a teaching ministry that the pastoral function of the ministry is presented in 
So John chapter uh, 21, verse 16, he tells Peter, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, what do you know that I love you? And he said to him, then tend my sheep. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, Peter says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not nor as being lords over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And that's mine and Richard's responsibility. You things that we do and we say, it'll affect everybody, right? Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 223. She said, those teachers who have not had, not who have not a progressive religious experience, who are not learning daily lessons in the school of Christ, that, that they may be in samples to the flock, but who accepted their wages as the main thing are not fit for the solemn, awfully solemn position they occupy. And that is very prevalent today. Sure. It's, she said, those teachers who have not a progressive religious experience, who are not learning daily lessons in the school of Christ, that they may be in samples to the flock, but who accept their wages as the main thing are not fit for the solemn, awfully solemn position to occupy. For this scripture is appropriate to all our schools established as God's design they should be after the order or example of schools of the prophets imparting a higher class of knowledge, mingling not dross with silver and wine with water, which is a representation of precious principles, false ideas and unsound practices are leavening the pure and the corrupting that which would should be kept pure and looked upon by the word by angels and by men as the Lord's institutions, schools where the education to love and fear God was made first. And this is the eternal life that they may know thee and the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he, they are, that thou hast sent neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And that's us. So when we come up here and we start talking about fables, start talking about things that doesn't exist in the word of God, and we're just talking some kind of foolishness, which is happening. I can go to churches and I look around, there's no Bibles. All they're doing is carrying laptops. People don't even open their word. They don't look at it with their own eyes and see the pages, touching the pages and turning them. The, the teachers and the preachers are not guiding the people in the word, but their own opinions and their own understanding. It's a dangerous thing. I have to stop here because it's 1252. I'll have to make this part seven. I want to ask you, though, do you understand a little bit now what it means to be the body of Christ? How important it is that, you know, when the Lord saw you, when you were born, born, that he had a plan for you. And it wasn't to go watch TV or to go to the movie theaters, you know, or to spend time in just mindless emptiness fruitless why were you born to be born again to be born again to know your creator that he is the lord and the savior and he's the only one that is to save and that there is to be no other gods isaiah 43 that you would be witnesses for him that's why we were born so that means in order for us to walk with the Lord, there might be some things we have to put down because it's heavy baggage that is dragging us and the devil is holding it, trying to keep us back from walking with the Lord. And part of understanding this and Walking with the Lord is knowing that this is happening. 
that the, that the devil is dragging us down and to say, I don't want this anymore. I'm trying to get to heaven. I believe everybody here is. Richard, get your microphone. Does anyone have the microphone? The devil's power to deceive is 20 times greater than when it was in the time of the apostles. That is very profound, and it's true. Yep. The devil's been around for over 6,000 years. He's been here for 6,000, approximate, plus or minus. And he knows his time is short. And he knows his time is short. That means he's going to try and take down anybody that he can't even know he knows he's lost. You understand? And so, yeah, that means we need to be 20 times closer to the Lord. And part of that is being the body of Christ. Because when we take up the cross and say, I want to be this. That means the Lord says, well, I got, I got work for you. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. I got work for you, man. It's not for, to you, for you to be saved, but it's because you are saved. The results of faith is by works. You will know a person's faith by their fruits and how they demonstrate their character from day to day. And I ask everybody here that's listening to me, everyone that's out there in telephone land here right now, if it's in your heart like it's in mine, I want to change. We have to. We have to. I can't do it. I can't. But the Lord can. Because I've seen it done in my life. The way I was 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you can't tell me that he can't do the rest. Of course he can. But we have to put it down. We have to put it down and say, enough. I don't want it no more. Right? So it's like you as it is with me today, I'm going to ask that we get on our knees and we pray. And we say, Lord, please help us be more grafted into your character because that's the way we will be saved. Not by our works, but by the works